All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Doc Diaspora Africa Renaissance Channel. I'm your host, Ego. Um, great to see you. Good to have you back. And uh, I have with me uh, Faruti Katembo. How are you doing? Hey, how are you, Jumbo? To you and, and to the audience. Jumbo. Thank you for having me. Jumbo, great to see you. Faruti is a, a regular commentator on Doc. And we appreciate his views and his perspectives on various topics. And you should check those out. And um, a few of the videos that will be up on the screen that uh, Bruce is participated in. So thanks for being here. Okay, let's get straight into it. Okay, the topic today is the United States, a place of many things African. That's the United States, a place of many things African. So I think some of you might be questioning, what does that mean? What does the United States have to do with Africa? Besi Africa besides the link through the obvious, uh, which is the slave trade. But um, as the title suggests, um, we wanted to delve into um, more than just the link due to uh, slavery, or excuse me, or the slave trade. Um, we wanted to discuss what cultural perspectives um, are shared or that Africa has embedded within the United States, if there are any. And um, to also um, identify the fact that, you know, those who are living in the United States, Africans living in the United States, African Americans, or as some would say Black Americans living in the U.S., um, that some feel that the, the, the culture there is one that is more Caucasian or white American and has no connection um, to Africa. So in essence, they're living in a, a different reality. Um, but as Baruti would, would, would like to uh, suggest and go into, uh, which when he brought up this topic, um, to show that um, in the USA or in the United States, that there are many, many things, and many, many um, symbolic, uh, physical, uh, cultural aspects and references that are African um, in origin and in, um, in ownership, um, but just are not presented as, as that. So we're going to take a look at some of those um, uh, as we go on in the show. So um, talking about African inserts and uh, uh, the backdrops, where we see how would you, um, first of all, would how would anyone um, believe that there are any that there's anything in the United States culture that is African? There some you know someone would argue that you know fine you know uh, Africans helped build up the United States, um, but they were never the the background constructors. They never laid the blueprint. Um, they were the the in, the geniuses behind the whole project, everything that you see in the United States and the, how great it is now is all down to um, the European settlers that went there and created it. The, the labor was just what was brought over there to just um, deliver the project and the plan. So how can anyone suggest that there is anything African in American history uh, or, or culture when it comes to um, technology, science, any contribu co contributing factors to the development of the place other than labor? Okay. Well, the African peoples that were brought to the, to this, uh, this uh, British colony as it uh, started out, obviously brought things from Africa that were used as part of the uh, slave labor. Um, but brought themselves and cultural things from Africa that became actually, in many cases, foundations. Um, and I should say that for the show, I had been thinking of, you know, some angles in which we could kind of talk about this subject. And of course, uh, I did pass along some, some notes to you. So I may make some reference to some of the things that I had uh, written down. But, but if you like, I will 
just kind of list some things from the sheet, if you wouldn't mind, that I wanted to just mention in quick form that uh, sort of form some of the basis for some of the cultural constructs, uh, you know, in general, if I, if I may. Oh, please do. Um, I listed um, the porch, you know, the front entrance veranda, and that actually is a uh, West African invention that was applied to houses in the uh, southern part of the United States on, on plantations and on actually uh, some of the African lodging that the African peoples built, because you know they had to build their own uh, dwellings on the plantations. They actually put porches onto the dwellings and um, those porches were actually recopied as part of the so-called Southern veranda of architecture uh, in the United States South. And I, and I referenced that from, um, from a book called In Small Things Forgotten, an, Ar an Archaeology of Early American Life by Professor James Dietz, 1996, the book. That's one uh, thing, there's so many, but um, barbecue, and I may have mentioned barbecue as a, um, as a cooking technique, but basically it comes from the word barbecue, which is from actually the Senegambia uh, in terms of a term, but we're talking about the idea of, um, you know, basically digging a pit, creating a fire in a pit, putting like bamboo rods over the um, over the covering, and then uh, putting pond type leaves and cooking meat and other sorts of things, basically smoking it on top of it. This was a technique that was brought from Africa uh, by the African people who were enslaved. And so, because, you know, all of the cooking basically on the plantations were done by African uh, African people for the for the plantation owner and their family. So African people cook for themselves, but also they cook for uh, the slave master and, and the children. So uh, whatever food was provided for them to cook, they uh, you know they used uh, African techniques and things they remember from Africa as part of the cooking. Um, the word yam, people say yam today, but really coming from the word yami, um, we're talking about the use of sweet potatoes, even though that's not exactly the same as the African yam, but the word stuck, but the notion of how to prepare, uh, you know, yams or yami, uh, you know, is something that was transferred over. And then we did further customizations, um, sweet potato pies or, candied yams, other sorts of things. How about the word um, goober? The word goober uh, means a nut, but it comes from the, the word uh, from uh, the uh, Kikongo language, nguba. Uh, interestingly, uh, and I, I was reading from some information I had, there's a person uh, by the name of Joseph Holloway. Uh, he has a book, and I have the book actually right here the book, maybe you can see it on the screen, it's called Africanisms in American Culture by, by Joseph Holloway. And Joseph Holloway um, traces lots of the you know, African cultural constructs in the United States, but in a small paper that he, he did uh, called African Crops and, and Slave Cuisine, uh, I wanted to point out that he makes mention of a term that used to be used a lot in the 18th century and prior to that by colonists, they call certain things gooba gobs. Gooba gobs, we're talking about the nguba, and gobs of the mounds of them. And these were types of ground nuts that were put on board slave ships to feed slaves being taken across the Atlantic Ocean to various uh, ports, whether it be Haiti, Jamaica, Brazil, uh, or to the, um, you know, uh, to the United 
United States. So these words, um, you know, survive. I um, also wanted to make mention of gumbo, of course, you know, as a main staple uh, type of soup, um, you know, uh, from another key Congo word that had to do with uh, a type of, um, you know, soup that was made in various African uh, peoples uh, in the United States have made gumbo and we still eat it in various parts, particularly in the South, whether it's in Florida, or Louisiana, or Georgia, or South Carolina, there's all kinds of little different ways to prepare this. Uh, the banjo, the instrument, the banjo is an African instrument coming from the word banja, uh, which was a Bantu word for word banjo, but that instrument was uh, rebirthed in the, the United States of African people taking the rudiments of that instrument and remaking it in the United States. And now you see on the screen the form that it is uh, in now. Um, there are a whole host of things, whether it be jazz, which has its origins and uh, the rhythms of the, of the Congo, all of the United States um, fundamental music, we'll say gospel, blues, jazz, all uh, were created by, by African peoples, but the rudiments of the music and the expression are, are from, from Africa. What happens is, unfortunately, that we haven't done enough of a good job on documenting the accomplishments and naming them by African uh, you know, entities and preserving that this is gonna be documented as African. So what happens is, particularly in the United States South, much of the so-called Southern culture when it comes to the food uh, preparations uh, and, and music and other sorts of things gets just listed as Southern culture, but it's African. I mean, people would find it interesting to know that even uh, fruits like watermelon you know, are African in origin. How did they get to the United States? The peanut varieties we're talking about, the rice varieties, watermelons uh, were, you know, put on board, you know, slave ships to feed slaves uh, coming across the Atlantic. So therefore the transmigration of these entities were uh, put as part of the palette that can be regrown, uh, particularly in the in the United States South, where the great concentration of Africans were in terms of the region of the country in a more long-lasting way that had um, that had chattel slavery to uh, to power the entire uh, economies of the United States itself. Um, I, 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 so I have just some things, and we can go into many other you know aspects. Um, but that's just from a historical level. And of course, we know that, you know, Africa in terms of mineral resources today are, you know, are the basis of, you know, the economies of most countries in the world, technologically and otherwise. I mean, if we dealt with the, the, the mineral tantalum, or Colton, as some people say, from Congo, we know that the uh, your cell phones and laptops would not work in the way that they work now without those, those minerals. But I know that you meant from a historical you know, uh, standpoint, so I wanted to just give you some of the cultural elements, but as the show goes on, we can actually talk about you know, physical, uh, you know, physical elements you know, as well. Okay, thank you. Oh, I, I wanted to ask, because when, when you were saying, you know, a lot of people don't don't know about some of the, especially objects and um, um, materials you just mentioned, and foods. Um, is there is there nothing in the educational system that that discusses this as part of history, that talks about these things at all? Not not generally, not as a part of school curriculums, because. Again, a lot of the cultural influences, foods, music, 
It might be a brief mention, but it's not really presented as African because the narrative becomes these are a part of Southern culture. So in other words, Southern culture in general, a lot of the foundation of what is considered Southern culture is, uh, is African. I wanted to give, like, for example, um, uh, whole cakes. And I'm, I'm reading something here from, uh, from Joseph Holloway, for example. He points out here, he says, another, and this is from the article that I was talking about, uh, African crops and slave cuisine. This, another important African dish was popular in the slave South was fufu, mm. a type of pancake says, by boiling water and stirring in flour and other ingredients. And he says in South Carolina, this dish is still called turn meal and flour. Is oh, really? Fufu by mixing palm oil while turning in flour. Yes, that's true. And so the notion of the whole cake was to take this basic mixture of flour, oil, other types of ingredients that African people found in this space and put it on the edge, on the end of a hole out on the plantation so that the sun would beat down on it and would sort of bake it in the hot sun and you could have a meal out on the plantation with this type of thing. Eventually, the whole cakes turned into pancakes that you're actually cooking in a pan and other sorts of things. So pancakes as an extension of whole cakes is an African food stuff that we brought with us from Africa, but recustomized it in the space that we were in in the United States and certainly in other places where African peoples were taken, whether it be Cuba, Haiti, Jamaica, Brazil, and other other places in the so-called Western Hemisphere. By the way, other sorts of uh, ideas like like cornbread, you know, we had long experience with the use of corn and grains, so. We recreated those types of um, culinary uh, conventions uh, in on these on these plantations. So the the food hasn't gone anywhere. The African techniques of preparing them haven't gone anywhere, except that they are not listed as African. It's simply part of of Southern culture. And I think. Um, there's a culinary historian, Michael Twitty, that does a very good job of pointing out the African uh, influences on cooking in the United States, um, particularly the 18th century, 17th and 18th century. Uh, so some work by him uh, uh, you know, has definitely been great regarding the documentation of, of all of these kinds of uh, all these kinds of things in general. Uh, even grits, uh, for example, you know, grits certainly came from the original notion about the um, the, uh, the shelling of uh, corn uh, husk. And so the granularization of that and then the cooking of that became eventually grits. And, uh, you know, grits is a main, a mainstay you know, food in the South, uh, in the U.S., but it's, you know, it certainly has gained, um, you know, even wider exposure in other areas of the United States. So, so fish and grits, uh, you know, eating various kinds of meats, you know, with, um, with, with grits. So I think these are, you know, important sorts of things that need to be sort of, um, you know, sort of dealt with uh, in general. Uh, by the way, I wanted to read something about the the yams, for example. Um, 
It says, uh, without question, yams were the most common African staple. It was fed to enslaved Africans on board ships bound for the Americas. The slave merchant John Barbo, B-A-R-B-O-T, for example, noted that a ship that takes in 500 slaves must provide about 100,000 yams, or roughly 200 per person. The ship logs of the slave vessel, the Elizabeth, bound for Rhode Island in 1754, listed provisions of yams, plantain, cornbread, fish, and rice. So uh, a lot of, again, a lot of these foods and the exposure to those foods as observed by um, Europeans uh, were from uh, Africa and became a part of their, their palate through um, the slave plantation system and black people cooking for, for, for white people and became a part of the culinary palate of the uh, United States in general as, uh, as time went on. Black eyed peas too are, are another African food stuff that is directly from Africa that is a part of the palate uh, in the United States in general. <laughs> Just as you mentioned, you, you, you went through the list of all those foods, you know, these are foods that are generally eaten across West Africa even to this day. Right. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised that, to hear that they're still eaten in the, in the, in the U.S. in that way. Um, it just shows that the connection is still there and knowing where the origins came from right. and that people right. still so, maintain that history is, is, is an interesting one. Right. So the, the culture is there. If you're talking about food as a major component of culture. It's just that it's not promoted as being African, which it should. And so therefore we have to take ownership that this is African. All people have to insist this is African and document that and know, and know that. One of the travesties that has happened is that we have allowed things that are African, even though we're dealing here right now, we talked about food, things that are African to get absorbed into being noted as just part of Southern culture, which contributes in some ways to the notion that, well, the African people who live in the United States call African Americans, they don't have any knowledge of Africa. Everything has been taken away from them. It was stripped of this, that, and the other, uh, and they are a new people who are no longer African with no ties to Africa. And that's the furthest thing from the, uh, from the truth. And that's why the, the book, again, uh, from Joseph Holloway, Africanisms in American Culture is an excellent one. I have a few others here that I can mention as well as, as the show uh, goes on. Excellent. I just, I just want to share a, a picture here as well. Um, just to just to go and highlight, you know, uh, kind of the root. I guess you could talk us through it more. The root of um, the main ports and the main um, corridors of of, of the slave um, trade, and where um, there was a lot of activity going on the west coast of Africa, in particular, and why uh, some of these foods and these cultures and some of the the actual um, inventions were taken across from these regions and still. Uh, exist there today. I don't know if you wanted to touch on on this map. Yes, I yes I do actually. Thanks for for pulling that up. Okay, so if we look at that basic map, you know, it's talking about slavery regions as in basically the launch off points from which uh, African peoples were were forcibly taken by ship across the um, across the Atlantic. Of course, um, many uh, Africans were taken from far into the interior of those uh, highlighted regions that you see and brought to the coast 
where they were forcibly uh, put on board ships for the voyage to the uh, various areas of the Americas. Now, so if I had to summarize in general where these regions are, it would be, I would break it into two regions that that can be combined together into one area. What I would say is the triangular node from Senegambia into today's Democratic Republic of Congo down to Angola. So where you see Senegambia, that's in orange, all the way over to the middle of the purple area that says West Central, all the way into that center, and then from where you have the arrow, go to the um, lower left, all the way to Angola, which would be down around there. Okay, so that triangular node region of Senegambia, DRC, to Angola, plus the uh, outer areas and metro areas of what we would consider to be Mozambique. So the vicinity of Mozambique, which is that other area that says Southeast. Okay, now, but African peoples came from further into the interior also uh, outside of those colored areas more into the center of the continent. So at different points in time, West Africa was thought of as where we see Senegambia all the way down to Angola, which is now considered Southern Africa. Okay, so now we see West Central, that includes what we think of as the Congo Kingdom, starting with a K, that comprises the countries of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Angola, and also Gabon. So West Central Africa actually, for a long periods of time, was where most of the Africans were actually taken from uh, particularly in the 18th century, even into the United States at certain points, as uh, Europeans took Africans from places going further and further down the uh, Atlantic coast. So where we now see Southeast, at certain points, that was called East Africa. Today we're saying Southeast Africa where we see Mozambique, but at certain points, anything on the right side of the continent was revert, referred to as East Africa. Now I point that out because sometimes the African diaspora peoples, but in particular, the ones who live in the United States are sometimes referred to as, as lost people. And I think that's totally incorrect. See, like lost people sounds like you have no idea of which regions you came from just because you're not pointing to a particular country. So what I've taken the liberty to do is to take these basic uh, areas that you show now, which is generally the vast areas where the African peoples were taken from for the transatlantic slave trade, uh, and even also uh, further inland too into um, what will now be parts of Zambia on the left-hand side, we'll get into that, and also little parts of Malawi as well, along with uh, Madagascar, by the way. Um, <clears throat> that I'm going to name this whole area uh, Kijiji Kikubwa. This whole area that you see in these multicolored uh, layers, we we'll call it um, uh, Kijiji Kikubwa. Kijiji Kikubwa is a Swahili term that means big village. 
And I'm saying big village because I'm connecting all these areas a huge space where these conglomerate of African people come from. Now, we got to remember that all of these countries that we now know of the continent now are actually newly named primarily. So at the time of the slave trade, these areas were not named in terms of the countries that we, we see today. But I wanted to rename the big area because that should be the region, and we could come up with other names, but I just, a quick reference, gave a Swahili name to that big region, because we don't need to make it appear as though the African populations in the diaspora are some lost group that you can't determine where they came from, just define the area where they came from and call it by something, even as, if it's not a specific country now, but it's a big region, because you don't need to make it seem like someone's a, a vagabond people or this vagabond image. I think that naming is a is a is a key uh, component. And as you have that map up right now, sometimes um, there's an overemphasis on the idea that uh, particularly the diaspora primarily just came from West Africa. Um, you know, and people think of West Africa as being on this map, you know, Senegal down to Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria. That sort of rounded uh, upper left hub. But there are a whole lot of other places as well in, in Central Africa, um, and also I wanted to point out, for example, that, you know, just a, a few months ago, there was a delegation of, uh, you know, of African Americans that went to, to Zambia. And we can see where Zambia is. Sometimes people debate whether Zambia is in Central Africa or whether Zambia is in Southern Africa, but actually, what is now Zambia, what is now Zimbabwe, and what is now Malawi in the colonial era post-1895 up to the 1960s was known as part of British Central Africa. So just the naming and the geographies change depending upon the perspective. But I wanted to point out that a delegation of uh, of you know African American uh, people had uh, traced their ancestry near the Zambia area, and uh, wanted to make some further connections uh, with uh, Zambia, and so they were greeted, um, you know, in a village uh, called the uh, called Mangu, M O N G U, and what was interesting is is that. Uh, history would show, uh, even from the oral narratives of some of the people there, that um, that there were lots of African peoples who were taken out of the western end of present-day Zambia. I want you to try to put a cursor on the western end, you're right about there, uh, of western Zambia, and were taken out of the western end of present-day Zambia, trans uh, ported along a river called the Lua Ginga River that extended from what we now know as Zambia into Angola. As you can see, Angola is right next to Zambia. But in today's era, you can see the, the lines of separation of sovereignty between Zambia and Angola. But the, um, the Lua Ginga River extended from the western end of Zambia into Angola, which Africans were taken into Angola and then eventually transported to the coast of Angola and then shipped off to the western um, hemisphere. So um, the reason why I'm mentioning that is because the slave trade was so wide and the diverse areas of which 
various Africans were taken means that we have lots of Africans and descendants of people in the Western Hemisphere who are African people who are basically the product of a conglomerate of different Africans from different regions of the continent, Central, South, East, and uh, so-called Western uh, part of, of Africa itself. And it should be noted that in you know, the, the year of return, which is to commemorate this year, of the 400th, primarily the 400th uh, year uh, since the since Africans were taken to around the area of what we consider Port, Port, Point Comfort, Virginia, 1619, as part of the uh, English colony of Virginia, it eventually became one of the bedrock areas to spawn what would become the United States, that these uh, Africans who were brought to Point Comfort around 1619 actually were taken from Angola. But we say Angola, but you know, they could have come from far in the, in the interior of Angola that, that now with the borders drawn the way they are, there's a separation between Angola and Zambia, but at that time, it was stretched very much into the interior of what is now considered parts of Zambia. So what I'm saying is we got to look beyond the, the current labelings of these African countries and begin to just look at these as African peoples. And as you and I have talked about on previous shows, primarily Bantu, uh, type peoples in terms of language and custom, you know, that kind of thing. So that this is an overarching term that talks about who these people uh, were or are, uh, as opposed to the current labeling uh, that they have been been given. So I wanted to just kind of point that, I wanted to kind of point that out because I think that's important as we give reference to where the different African peoples you know, uh, had, had, had come from. So we could just make just as much case that you know, large quantities of people came from Angola, or what we now know as Angola. There were substantial amounts of people that came from what we now know as Nigeria, Ghana, the Congo, Mozambique, uh, in fact, um, in the National African American Museum in Washington, D.C., that just opened uh, officially a couple of years ago, uh, there were some remnants of a, a ship uh, called the uh, San Jao. I think it was J uh, O J A O A. I think, or J-O-A-O, I forgot, the San Jao ship. And this was part of the museum. And they had some ballast and some other little pieces of the remaining vessel. But that vessel was actually a Portuguese vessel that was bringing Africans from Mozambique around the bottom of Cape Hope in South Africa and the ship ran aground uh, or shipwrecked or, or wrecked from a huge storm, but that ship was, bring, was to bring Africans from what we now know as Mozambique area over to uh, Brazil. So that was part of the uh, National African American uh, Museum. So we can see that Mozambique was also a place that was um, a port, port and part of a departure of African uh, peoples. And I think that's significant to know. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree. Um, there's been a lot of um, discussion about, you know, the the origins of um, those who were taken from the western part of Africa. And I guess that also would bring with it some confusion as to the origins of some 
of the items, the culture, and, and, and the, the food um, that, that we see um, being over there in the, in the US. But it's good that you pointed out that we should um, uh, take it as the wider grouping of Bantu culture that was transported um, over to the, U to the US and um, took different iterations as well. Um, some of them have been, um, I guess, uh, adopted in a different way to suit the needs of the people um, as they were there. Uh, even a more recent um, example of that, I would say, uh, were for my parents who live in the UK. Um, when they arrived, apparently this was in the, probably the 60s or 50s, um, the example of fufu or a, a pound of yam as they used to eat it um, didn't exist. They didn't have a shop to buy it. It wasn't here. But they had something here. The, the British had something here called semolina. So uh, semolina is a kind of, um, I would say, I guess it's like kind of oatmeal slash kind of cornmeal, but something that they have is a kind of porridge. So it's quite uh, watery. So as um, uh, j just to adapt, to have something to eat with their soups, as, as West Africans generally do, or Africans in general, Bantu people. So they ad adapted the semolina, made it a bit thicker, a bit hardened, uh, didn't add any milk, and it, it's now become a, a regular dish um, as a substitute for uh, fufu and pounded yam and cornmeal and maize meal and things like that. But um, um, yeah, just interesting things like the cornbread, obviously, is, is, a, is a good example of reference to this. And um, yeah, um, the, the structures of the borders um, have confused um, the origins of where people originally came from as well all the time. And it's good to just you know, exemplify that. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I, want, I wanted to ask um, another question. So when it comes to um, these, uh, I guess, when you say geospaces, uh, uh, and saying obviously the US in place of many things African, would you say that even though the culture still exists, although it's not taught in schools, um, so people would know about it, they assume that the culture was lost or the culture that exists isn't um, African at all, is there a need for for this um, education? Do people need to? Is there any benefit for people knowing that this is African? For some people who still practice those um, those African um, cultural practices, um, who don't know it's African, um, probably don't don't care, um, don't see there's any benefit to know. They probably assimilated into the wider American culture or Black culture. Is there any benef benefit to them knowing that this is from their past history? Well, yes, it is, because if they don't know that, then they might be led to think they are something, that they are something other than Africa. And so uh, being African is not just defined to whether you're living physically on the African continent, but it's, you know, your ancestry that links you to the spaces and cultural nuances that you originally were a part of that's, that's handed down. I, I, I want to kind of address what you're asking by, by sort of kind of giving, in my perspective, the, the United States. Okay, so we've got what we call the United States that primarily is a, what I would call a, a pan-Caucasian country. Now, when we say pan-Caucasian, we're talking about across the board of various types of people that are considered Caucasian. Now, at the same time, you know, in terms of the African people, it's a pan-African space as well, it's just that the demographics for the pan-African space are, are in the minority. So 
African people make up about maybe 15 percent of the uh, of the United States, but that's about 50 million at this point. If you take into consideration, the United States is roughly about 325 325 million uh, people, but the United States or what became the United States from the former British colony started out in terms of ethnicity of white people as Anglo, okay, from British stock. So we can get into whether they were English, Irish, uh, you know, Welsh, Scottish, but the, the mix of, of Anglo Saxon people, British uh, people. Okay, eventually, being a beacon for more different types of Europeans than just the British strain to come and to gain wealth early on as planters, but just white people are welcome, period. And then eventually to um, have so many different types of these people that may not just be European, but have the phenotype of basically light light skin and straight hair that come up with new terms to define these people who would just basically be white or Caucasian in general. So that includes um, people today who are from Arab regions, uh, Jews, uh, even people who are regarded as Hispanic. So basically in the United States, anybody who isn't regarded as a black person generally, unless you're going to make a technical case for people who are Asian are generally thought of as, as Caucasian. So the African population is a, is a amalgamation or blend primarily of these different Af African peoples of these different regions that we pointed out a little bit earlier in, in the show. Now the travesty in my mind is that I don't think that um, we have uh, had a proper labeling, okay, to reflect our Africanness. Now, if I can just go into that for a second. So we know that uh, we identified as Negro earlier on. These are obviously white terms, Negro, from the white people's uh, Latin rootings that dealt with N-I-G-E-R or Negrum from the Latin eventually uh, spawned Negro, Negro uh, as things that, as, as a label that they would give to black people uh, from the roots of the Latin. Okay, then we decided, okay, well, we're gonna try to come up with a, a way of describing ourselves to acknowledge the positiveness of darkness. So black was used. Black was used to say as an abstract racial identifier to say us versus them, them being the dominant society of white people. All right, so we have the term black being used positively in the late 60s into the 1970s and into the 1980s. Then the term African-American was kind of uh, coined with the idea that you know you wanted to reference a land base that was the idea of putting african american so it's so an african american would be that it would be a person of african ancestry who lived in this country that some called america even though it's the united states okay where i think we took a wrong turn in evolution is that we didn't continue to define ourselves to select an African name or Bantu name for who we were that encapsulated all of our experiences in the country, including all of the accomplishments and all of the uh, cultural practices and cultural items that we transferred from Africa into a, a new space in, in the United States. And I think that this right here has been a, a great problem 
so that it has spawned a void that would allow someone to now think that they are not not African and therefore all that they do, much of what they do, much of the culture in the United States is built on black people, that they don't have an appreciation that it is African. And so therefore we get other kinds of terms now that are being used uh, you know, more in insistence like black American, which I think is an insulting term for varying reasons. Um, because it does not uh, give any credence to your Africanness. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm not really a proponent that much of the term African American. I mean, I think that the term American really was a term in its document as defined uh, a European colonists. In fact, I, I wrote down, I wrote down that uh, the term American. I got this from an older dictionary at some point, but it said that American um, had been an 18th century definition was a term that defined a white citizen or inhabitant of the former British colony who was not from any of the aboriginal races. So this was just a term that the colonialists used to define their ethnicity. And um, therefore, I'm I'm really you know uncomfortable in uh, African people naming themselves after a white man anyway. I mean, the word American comes from the word Amerigo Vespucius. But you know, I I can stomach temporarily without a better term. But I'd like for us to develop one, an African one. Uh, the term African American, I, I stomach that because the sentiment was that you were an African person living in the space that some people call America. But I wish to move away from, from that to even define more succinctly an African term. But the term Black American, I consider definitely be an insult. And prior to the show, I, I said I put the term Black American on the same level as I would put someone identifying themselves as a Black Rhodesian. You know, in other words, you're going to take what a white person defined for themselves and then you're going to make uh, an abstract idea about race and make that an appendage, you know, for yourself. I don't think that that's, um, I don't think that that's, you know, correct. But, but then you and, live in the same country. You know, they know there'll be a lot of um, opposition to that. Some would argue that, um, slavery history or not that they their ancestors um have suffered built america and fought for it and when it comes to um with the fight to get what's justly theirs that they are entitled to america just as much as anyone else is and therefore they should be able to claim that they are uh, American in order to get what they believe is their um, birthright. And as such, um, going by the name um, Black American or not mentioning Africa doesn't exclude you from being recognized as part of the, the country that you, you need your just dues from. Um, I mean, we've seen um, the recent uh, and I hope now to fund the ADOS movement, uh, American descendants of slaves, who specifically view themselves as, as black Americans, um, not making much reference. In fact, definitely in opposition to being called African Americans, but they would be a archetypal um, group or represent, representation of a person who would not agree with you. Um, those views you just said just now. So what, do, do, do you think that they're, are they wrong or do they have a point or can both, I don't know, in some ways coexist in, in ideology? They're, they're wrong, period, <laughs> because, you know, there's just so much evidence that the, that the cultural constructs that African people have brought even to the United States 
are still African. So by that, they should label it as African the, it, itself. Why, why, would, why would you trace with the history I'm talking about, which can be documented, why would you trace all of this stuff to Africa and not claim that it is African? What, what, what makes someone not an African because they aren't living in Africa itself when they take all that they are and bring it to another place? So we do a disservice by these kinds of analyses uh, in general. And uh, if you're living in a particular place, you can be a different people by name what you call yourself should not give you any more leverage to, to uh, gain access to, to reparations for slavery at all. That, that, that's nothing to do with it. That's just a, a, a ploy that you think that it gives you some more uh, leverage when that's not so. So the insistence that numbers of people are, are, are using Black American, by the way, the, the ADOS movement, for example, um, you know, some people debate about uh, American descendants of slaves, and some people say American descendants of slavery. Um, but nevertheless, some of those adherents identify themselves as ADOS. They don't really sometimes say Black Americans, but other people say Black Americans, but they adhere to the ADOS philosophy. But really, this ADOS notion that you are not African and the pan-African ideas need to be swept aside, in many cases has been given uh, legitimacy and, 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 you know, sort of uh, rhetoric exposure because of the idea that you now have, you know, black people who are immigrants into the United States recently from Caribbean and African countries. So to distinguish yourself from them, to supposedly make the case that, you know, to, to stand in line to the descendants of the, the European colonizers and enslavers, that, you know, here's gonna be these particular black people that distinguish themselves from immigrants, then you retreat into using the term black American so that other people can say, well, I'm a Nigerian American, and eventually as a group to say, I'm African American if you came from Senegal, Nigeria, Congo, or some other place in an African country, you know, recently. Um, but that's a, you know, again, to me, that's a disservice, you know, intellectually, because you are African, and if you have contributed all of these things within the United States that are African, then it should be given credit. Other than that, you allow the theft of your heritage and ancestry and contributions to be stolen by others while you mislabel yourself for, for no gain. How can they be any strength in African people naming themselves on, underneath the condition of being slaves to say, I'm ADOS, whether it be saying American descendant of slaves or American descendants of slavery, that some people are asking that that term be put on the census to define yourself like that, like a like the victimization. How can, how can that possibly be of any strength, or how can it be of any strength for black people to name themselves after white after white people? Period. Well, well the colonizer names themselves by an ethnic group, and then you name yourself as an appendix. There's no strength in that. I, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm just playing. Um, I'm play, playing the opposite advocate, I guess. And and some will say, well, you you, you can't force. Uh, a certain group of people or person to say that they're African, they feel they are they are not. Um, that what they are, what they represent, is a 
moment in time, part of history that has rendered them citizens of the country they're in. They don't want to deny it. They might like what it represents. But more, more so to this, to this topic is they feel that um, to, to make Africa the center point of their identity would diminish their Americanness and potentially the benefits that might come with that. that yeah, but that, that has nothing to do with, um, you know, the enslavement, what they're calling themselves. They're not going to get any more uh, benefit from, you know, trying to discard themselves of their Africanness, ideologically or anywhere, uh, by, by saying that you, you, you're not that uh, at, at all. In fact, um, just because, you know, I, I didn't know exactly what we were getting to in terms of all the questions and everything, but I, I felt like, um, you know, you might ask, as you said, a few um, play the devil's uh, advocate uh, mm -hmm. questions. What I did was I um, just happened to bring with me here a couple of, of books. I want to show on the screen a book here. It's called um, Children of Africa. It's a coloring book. Hmm. I'll show you the back. Uh, hope we can see the back. Yes, I can see. The year this coloring book was created was actually 1970. It was done by um, a publishing venture called Drum and Spear Press. And actually, as a, a child, I was given this coloring book. I actually bought this coloring book later in life as an adult because I, I loved it so much as a child. I mean, you know, as a, as a little kid, you know, I marked it up with markers and all like that, color, uh, crayons and stuff. But I actually bought the same book as an adult. But interestingly enough, this is 1970. And I just wanted to read a couple of lines from, from this particular uh, book. It says, as parents, this is from 1970, as parents, we must assume the responsibility of educating our children so that they clearly understand who they were. And the next picture, after that statement in the book is read, and you might not be able to exactly see the entire picture based on the size of the screen, but that the picture has a caption over it, and it says, all over the world, there are African children like you. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, it says, so that they understand the richness of our past as African as African people, and so that they understand their responsibilities in working toward the unity of our people so that we may once again be an independent people. And the book concludes with, we are an African people. This is 1970. Now, another little piece that you might find interesting is a, a little booklet that was put out in 1988. Book is entitled, Who is the New Africa? This is 1988, written by a person by the name of Zolo Agona Azania. On page one of the book, because these issues about being African were debated heavily in the late 1960s underneath the Black Power Movement, of which, which Kwanzaa, to reacquaint us with our Africanness and maintain that as a holiday or the seven day holiday, was birthed out of the uh, Black Power Movement. Uh, these ideas about wearing African clothes, African names, 
uh, you know, were part of the discussions in, in, in those years. Somehow or another it got curtailed into other ideas, perhaps the incompleteness of the naming where it got just left at African-American without a constant involvement. But nevertheless, the term new African had been thrown about. But again, the idea of African being in the mix. And from page one of this little book that I just mentioned, who is the new African? It defines the new African is a black person whose ancestors were kidnapped from many different African tribes, mainly from West and the South Coast of Africa and brought to America in the holes of slave ships. So this is 1988. So 1970, you can see a coloring book that says Children of Africa. A book from 1988 that says, who is the new African? But somehow or another, 50 years later, there's a, a term in which uh, there's an advocation for a term, American descendants of, of slavery, of which you are now advocating that you abandon your Africanness. Something has gone radically wrong in a in, in definitely a wrong di direction. And there's no um, his, history and research to support the ideological foundations of that, of why black people in the United States are not an African people when there is so much evidence to the contrary of that. There's none. And I, and, I, and I don't support it in any kind of way because it can be refuted. But the thing is, because we have social media today, you can create movements off of some ideological falsity. It's not that reparations aren't due. It's that reparations should have nothing to do whether or not you're going to uh, you know, disavow your being African or not. As a, as, a, as a way to gain leverage to uh, somehow or another that, you know, the United States is your only anchor bed and therefore to shed your Africanness gives you some kind of leverage uh, that you would not get in, 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 the, uh, in the quest for, for reparation. Uh, I, I hear that, Booty, and I, I completely agree with you. Um, I, I think, And this, this reminds me of a show we, we did once. Uh, I think the title was Poly Africanism, mm -hmm. um, which was like, a, I think I called it a reformation of Pan Africanism. Um, and I think this sort of just my mind back to that in that these, these factions, I'll call them, I think sometimes would always exist in these spaces. Um, there's sometimes uh, the continuity or the continuum from an ideology that's widespread from one generation to the next sometimes gets lost if it's not reinforced. If it's not reinforced or if it's allowed to be uh, dismembered by some external forces or corrupted. Um, so it really needs to be protected and reinforced over time and passed down through generation and for continuity to exist. Once continuity is broken, you have this new reinventions that, that, that occur. And it's, it's, it doesn't just happen in, in the United States. I think this happens in, in Africa as well. You know, there, there, there are people who now don't see um, or even understand the push for unity following um, the independence era, following uh, post-colonialism some that still don't realize that there is neo-colonialism, some don't see it. The, when you try to explain some of those people, they'll tell you, well, why are you always blaming, blaming um, colonialists or the white man for your issues? Some of them don't know about things like the Berlin Conference and things like that. There's no continuity that's passed down, so people can't really figure it out. So 
I don't think this is just unique to the U.S. alone, but since we're focusing on the U.S., um, from what I've heard, I think people like the ADOS movement are they're, they're breaking apart at the seams, which is um, which is good good to to see. I think it was inevitable anyway. I think it was always going to happen because an ideology based on that kind of division and lack of understanding was always going to fail um, in the wider scheme of things. Um, so long may, may that continue. Long may that continue. But um, I want us to go go back to, to the subject. Now, since um, I think, uh, so besides we've talked about um, you know, the porch, uh, musical instruments, food, uh, uh, things like the barbecue, uh, and, and, and a few others. I, I just wanted to ask if there, there are a few other things that, that you know or could point to that has um, African uh, Bantu culture at the center of it that exists that we don't know about? Yes, there are. Um, I want you to also, as I, if I, I can deal with that right now, but I also don't want to leave the show. So if you can put a reminder after I deal with that particular question you asked about, mm -hmm. if we can deal with where I think that the naming should have evolved to and where it still can evolve to beyond, um, you know, uh, African American and where it could lead to just some option ideas that I had in my mind. So please remind me to, to do that because I want to talk about that because I do think that uh, Black American insistence on that today by some uh, is a wrong turn. I think that uh, labeling someone as Adolf's American descendants of slavery is also a wrong term, but I have some ideas on the rationale of options of where I think we should go that would be better for us. But to answer uh, just to list a few things, uh, let's see. In the United States annually, can you guess the amount of African festivals that have generally been documented? Mm. No. What is it documented? Do you mean the, the uh, official, officially recognized by, say, government to be done? Uh, no, just, um, you know, websites and just uh, events that are denoted, you know, that these events uh, took place. How many do you think per year? Uh, 50. All right. So we got to uh, multiply that to about four. So about 200. African festivals uh, uh, annually in uh -huh. the United States. Uh, so, uh -huh. so uh, let's, let me list a few other things. Uh, neodymium. Neodymium is a, uh, a metal, one of the rare earth metals, by the way, that is heavily found in the country of Namibia. It's used to make uh, hybrid car engine magnets. So that's a you know a physical item that's used obviously all over the world uh, for hybrid cars, but you know the hybrid cars in the United States. So um, you know neodymium is used. I mentioned earlier about the coltan or tantalum that's used uh, in cell phones to boost the capacity, capacitor power in uh, cell phones and laptops. Um, in Pingo wood, which we know as ebony wood, and Pingo wood is a Bantu name for ebony wood, uh, this kind of wood is used to make clarinets and oboes and violin chin rests. Uh, some time ago, not anymore with the, uh, the ban on the killing of elephants, but, you know, piano keys, used to be made from ivory tusk. Um, what about pestle and mortar? You know, that was a uh, African millet pounding tool for granulating uh, corn and, you know, other sorts of uh, foodstuffs that was used in South Carolina in the 18th century. 
um, as a pounding tool that was directly transported from Africa. And before we actually had the, the machines of today, that pounding tool, the, uh, the uh, pestle and mortar, mortar. Uh, yeah. was considered the best tool to, um, to granulate uh, millet. Um, now, you've heard of uh, tilapia fish, correct? Yes. Well, actually, tilapia fish is obviously eaten all over the world, but the name tilapia is from the uh, Saswana word tilape. T-L-H-A-P-E. So the word tilapia that we know tilapia is from a Saswana word, which is from Botswana. Okay, now I brought with me, um, see the little game here? Jenga, I may have mentioned this on a previous show, but uh, the game, the building block game, Jenga, is named after the Swahili word Kujanga, which means to build. So even the toy here, uh, you know, is named after, um, you know, an African word, key Swahili word, in fact. Uh, we talked about blues, gospel, jazz, and I'm going to add in R&B, all African uh, derivatives, and our core pillars of music in the United States. And indeed, I should say, all over the world in general. I also brought with me um, Limba. And uh, it actually is, uh, Limba is actually a Shona word that kind of means little music. Now, the reason why I, I have this in my hand is because as you and I- Could, 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 could we see it? We haven't seen it. Could we, have a, could we see it? Oh, yes. The Kalimba. Okay. Thank okay. you. And so um, it's actually a, a finger piano called by varying names, but I'm saying Kalimba is just one of the Bantu names. But as you and I have, have talked about before, Maurice White, who was the creator and band leader of uh, the um, R&B group uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. Hmm. Um, you know, was a master performer on the uh, on the Kalimba. In fact, uh, the the record label of Earth, Wind, and Fire was known as Kalimba Records. Uh. So I had that instrument. I, I I forgot where I got. I, I picked that instrument up when I was in uh, either Swaziland or Tanzania. I can't remember uh, which uh, country I picked that that, uh, that Kalimba up, but you know, he he was a master performer on that instrument and obviously gave lots of audiences, you know, a view of that instrument that they might not have known um, before. Um, this uh, item here by Dow Soap, which is a major uh, soap producer in the United States. And I would say certainly Dow is... Uh, is international. Uh, this particular um, brand of the Dow soap is made with marula oil, as you can see right here on the uh, on the cover. Marula oil, uh, marula is a, a word from uh, Southern Africa that is from a uh, from a nut that has certain kinds of oil in it that's used in soaps and other things. But there are huge marula festivals that uh, take place. Uh, between Swaziland, Mozambique, and South Africa uh, each year. So uh, there's no secret to even the word. Um, and then, of course, I want to say something about um, Ubuntu. And you and I have talked about, you know, Ubuntu, you know, before. And, and most people, of course, know Ubuntu as like, uh, you know, an African philosophy about humanism. It's true um, that, you know, I am because you are, that you need a community of people to enhance your humanity and therefore an elevation of yourself as you're, you know, interconnected with other people. But 
I want to also point out that Ubuntu is now the name of uh, an open source software platform. That's one. And also Ubuntu or the concepts of Ubuntu is, are now being thought of as a business tool uh, that numbers of corporations are training their, their staff, their administrations, and their workers in the notion of Ubuntu to uh, facilitate you know, manager worker cooperation. So even uh, an African philosophy is now being labeled as a business tool and practiced as a business tool. There are whole books out on Ubuntu as that and an open source software platform. In fact, if, if on your screen, if you put in the word Ubuntu and just put images, just put Ubuntu in, just click on images and see what comes up. And maybe we can we can see that. Okay. Now you just click on images. Yes. Okay. Um, so let's go down a little bit to see if they. I guess you can probably see it on your screen whether either show uh, some books on Ubuntu or something dealing with uh, with technology, but. We can see so many things they have about Ubuntu that looks like uh, something to do with a computer screen, which I said it was uh, an open uh, source um, uh, software platform. Mm. There are books uh, on uh, Ubuntu. In fact, maybe put um, Ubuntu and then put a plus sign and put a book. See if anything comes up. Yeah, it's incredible. Oh, by the way, see that book there that has $7.99, seven uh, pounds and 99, is it 99 pence? Yep, yep. Okay, that book right there is a book written by a couple of business professors. In fact, I actually have that book. Uh, but it's a book written by some business professors talking about uh, the practice of Ubuntu in the uh, workplace. But as you can see, there's an array of, of books dealing with Ubuntu, um, dealing with uh, its software applications and also as a business tool. Okay. So um, those are just some of the, um, you know, just some of the the ideas, you know, around, you know, lots lots of things, you know, being African uh, around us that we don't um, that we don't even really think about, you know. But I think that with the knowledge of this, then I think that we'd be better off, and I think that people would have a better grounding. Our people would have a better grounding, and why why we're African. Now, African may sound, you know, very, very generic, and it is, and I think that particular peoples have to have specific labels, of course, as we fit into, you know, our place within the, you know, African family. So um, if we could, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just kind of give a couple of thoughts on where I think we should have gone, where I think we should have gone from, from here. Um, as I said, uh, African-American sort of made popular in the mid to late 1980s um, was kind of made popular in some ways by Reverend Jesse Jackson and others who um, thought that we should be a people in the United States that were labeled by a land base as opposed to just saying black as a sort of a nebulous or just abstract uh, notion about race uh, without it being linked to, you know, a particular uh, cultural slant. 
And as you and I talked about, you know, culture includes seven major areas, you know, religion, of course, uh, social development, politics, economics, art, and within art, we can talk about the creation of things, including, you know, technology, music, food, um, ethos in terms of your, you know, the personality of who you are, uh, and history. So primarily seven major areas. And I think that any people should define themselves from a language base that represents their, their ancient ancestry in some sort of way, so that when you utter who you are, you are uttering a connection linguistically to the past that anchors you then to where you are now that allows you to encapsulate all, all that you are. So in past shows, we've made passing references to the term Bacala. And uh, I actually have the book called The Bacala of, of North America here. And it's written by a person by the name of Asar Imhotep, who was a, a linguist, along with being a um, computer, computer uh, software specialist. Um, and he kind of did research on the term Bacala, which kind of deals with what you might call proto-Bantu type words. In other words, he was looking for a characteristic of what he would consider African-American people, which he kind of came up with the idea of enduring, uh, people of great resilience, um, you know, that kind of thing. And so in his research, the word Kala had to do with that kind of energy, of fire, resilience, um, you know, from ancient texts that spanned even um, research into ancient uh, Kemet, along with uh, languages that helped shape ancient Egypt, which from his um, research with languages like what we now call Chaluba, which is one of the languages in the Congo. So as we go further and further back, we'll see that you know ancient Egypt, the languages of Egypt, there were many, um, included obviously these different languages that we would consider now to be pretty much uh, Bantu languages. So in studying common terms that were from a variety of different uh, African languages, you know, he came up with uh, words like Kala, which had to do with, um, you know, energy, uh, resilience. And in the BA, on the front of it was simply a prefix, Bacala. So that's one idea, and which I think is valid, to define yourself and encapsulate all that you are. So he's saying, you know, Bacala would be a good term. I can certainly deal with that, and I think that's, that's great. Um, I also wanted to throw out, um, you know, Kiswahili. I throw out Kiswahili as a source of words because since Kiswahili is such a general African Bantu language, it certainly parallels the notion that the current people known as African American people actually come from a conglomerate of different African peoples in different geographical spaces on, on the continent, as we talked about uh, before. So since Kiswahili is a general uh, language, I think a word from, from Kiswahili would, would also work as well. I just happened to pick um, a, a term. The word Ujuzi, U-J-U-Z-I in Kiswahili has to do with um, kind of the context of you know, enlightenment, insightfulness, kind of levels of innovation, still in kind of parallel with the idea of resilience, uh, you know, quick thinking, innovation. Um, if you were to take the U off of Ujuzi at the very beginning, and you would add an M and call it Ujuzi, that would be a person 
who exhibited the characteristics of Ujuzi. And if you put a W-A in front, in front of it, Wajuzi, that would mean people that do that. So that's an idea because I do agree with Asar Imhotep that if I had to pick out, you know, an ethos um, of the African diaspora, but particularly in this case, the one in the United States, I think with the, the hurdles and challenges that we have faced in the United States, we are a, a resilient people. So I do think that that type of adjective, you know, would, would fit us. And I think that he's right that it should be from an African name. So Wajuzi is just something that I would say kind of fits the model of what I'm talking about, though, you know, there are other words, of course, that can be researched. Now, finally, what I had actually spent some time to do, and it wasn't that easy to find, was um, I wanted to just kind of uh, look at the Congo languages. And again, I want to say K-O-N-G-O, to talk about the Congo Kingdom, which um, there are a lot of uh, significant uh, portions of African peoples that were taken from the Congo Kingdom, which comprises the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Congo, um, and Angola, and Gabon. So Kikongo is one of the languages that you know, is spoken in those those four countries, inclusive of Angola. And as we had spoken earlier in the program, Angola was the source of the or what we now know as Angola is was the source of where those Africans were taken to uh, in the uh, Virginia colony of. Uh, 1619. Actually, you had some privateer uh, British vessels that basically uh, shanghaied a, um, a Portuguese vessel that was taking those Africans to what we now know as present-day Mexico. And these privateer uh, British vessels commandeered the Portuguese vessel and took the, the cargo of the Portuguese vessel that had the African peoples on board and took them uh, to the Virginia colony where they could be traded for uh, supplies that those privateer ships um, wanted. So that's how the Africans from Angola had gotten there. There actually have been ceremonies recently in the United States to commemorate those African peoples who were basically the first Africans to land on the shores of what became the English United States. In other words, because the, this space was being colonized by various kinds of Europeans, there were Africans, of course, in what became Spanish uh, territory, French territory, but the English uh, settlement began to be the, the ground root of what became the United States in terms of, you know, a uh, white cultural uh, construct. So to honor the language base and region, you know, maybe a word from Kikongo that had something to do with uh, resilience or innovation. So I tried to find a word from uh, Kikongo that, that did that. And I, I called various embassies and different colleges and schools. And eventually I was able to get a professor, and I guess I should acknowledge him, his name is uh, Professor Mufwene from the University of Chicago. And he was able to um, provide me with some information of what I was looking for. But he said that there were no words in his knowledge of Kikongo that actually just meant a, a person or a group of people that were innovative, you know, that putting that together uh, was not something that had happened in the past like that, but people spoke in phrases that defined, you know, an activity. So he gave me this little phrase, Impila ya mpa ya kusala makambo, which means the way of new 
of doing things, the way of new of doing things, which would translate to us as a new way of doing things. Now that's a complete phrase, but nevertheless, the concept is that, you know, a word from maybe that type of uh, language would be very fitting. So if I had to, you know, look at it, I think that, you know, from my own vantage point, I would be comfortable with any of the three concepts I mentioned. The Bacala term, be a sort of a proto-Bantu angle. Um, with Juzi as a concept would be just the Pan-African angle generally, or the phrase that I just mentioned from uh, the Congo language would be what I would call a geo-specific uh, commemorative angle. I probably would go with the geo-specific only because we're referencing, you know, uh, an area that some of our people had, had, had come from to commemorate those Africans who were brought that we know to a particular place in what became um, the United States, but nevertheless, some Bantu name period. But I think that our researchers and linguists should explore that so that we evolve from African American to a Bantu name that defines us. Because what that does is that allows you to anchor yourself in your own narrative and in your own history as you stretch it back. In other words, you don't want to leave the impression within anyone that you start your history in servitude as though you don't have any roots other than to be a slave unto someone else and a slave unto yourself. And uh, I, I definitely mention, you know, I've read a lot of materials and perhaps you've heard of this gentleman here, Ngugi Watiango. Have you heard of Ngugi? Yes. Uh, a very famous writer from Kenya. The book that I held up was a book, a very famous book he did called Decolonizing the Mind. In fact, in, um, in early post-colonial Kenya, he was actually uh, jailed in the, um, I believe in the early 1970s for daring to create community theaters uh, of which he said that he encouraged the people to speak Kikuyu, his native uh, language, and to disavow speaking in English uh, as he thought to restore language or culture through using language as a medium. He was actually jailed in um, early post-colonial Kenya for defying the government of trying to create an insurrection through language as a medium to preserve culture and the integrated narrative of African people. So language is very important, and he is someone who's still around, by the way, uh, who's written many books about language, and he says that language really is a glue um, that holds any people together that allows them to uh, share their narrative of themselves to themselves and therefore to others. So if you have any people who define themselves as an extension of their original language, they preserve forever who they are in the mind of themselves and therefore that has to, to increase you know, an, internal, an internal power. So uh, these become very, very important, um, uh, you know, ideas. I also, I also want to uh, just say uh, that, and I'm, I didn't mention this earlier, but I think I will now at, at this point. Um, in, in the United States, we have a real problem not just white supremacy, that is a problem, 
but it does not appear as though the African population will in any way be the majority. We're going to probably be a permanent uh, minority. Um, and so therefore our struggles continue just because we don't have the numbers for more power, though we could be doing better, knowledge of oneself, uh, reconnections with Africa, the continent will, will help. But I'm talking about just on a demographic uh, basis. Uh, during the slave era, African people made up probably about 25 to 30 percent of the United States population. In some cases in the South, making up actually over 50% in, in states like um, South Carolina and in Mississippi. But as time has gone on, particularly uh, the points in time after the Civil War where white immigrants different stocks of people than were the original stocks of British white people they began to pour more heavily into the United States coming from Eastern Europe and lots of other places. Um, then the African population, of course, was not immigrating in. And so therefore we were losing ground in terms of populations of people. So now we're about 15% of the population, but new Caucasian peoples come all the time or thus and such are, are labeled as that. So the current, one of the current issues in the US is about illegal immigration or immigrations of people that are not from the so-called white stock. But primarily, the so-called illegal immigration or illegal immigration, primarily of people coming from Central America, specifically Mexico. Now, right now, in terms of the way the United States defines people who are Mexican and by extension other people who are regarded as Hispanic, is they are regarded as white in terms of race or, or Caucasian. So census forms now, uh, you know, will ask a person, okay, irrespective of whether you identify yourself as Hispanic, what is your race? So a person can put down their white and then they have spaces on applications and other forms of identification of who you are ethnically or racially or, ethnic or racially for you to define what country of origin. So therefore, right now, they are regarded as, as Caucasian on paper, but may not be seen overall to just say, okay, just white. But again, the Caucasian term is uh, you know, kind of a catch-all. And so there's a lot of consternation about people coming into the United States from uh, Mexico and uh, you know how you know it's created a lot of turmoil about about jobs, about white nationalism, etc. And I believe that eventually that situation will be resolved when the European stock of people eventually regard the people who are from Mexico as being a Caucasian, just outright with them. But I think eventually they'll come to that conclusion. And I was thinking about that because sometimes black people, African people believe that because you have people that are coming to the United States who are not regarded as European, that this somehow represents a browning, supposedly, a browning of the United States, a browning of America, as though they're gonna have a, a greater stake of fairness and leverage into the United States because the European population somehow uh, may, be, may be dwindling. But that's not, that's not true at all if the bigger picture is being 
you know, Caucasian, which will eventually mean the same thing. So what I'm saying is that in the future, uh, black people won't have any more leverage than they have now or at any time because they still are in a Caucasian geospace. And I make reference to this, um, and I, I, I had it in some of the notes that you have, but I want to mention this. There's a book called White Shift. That's the main title, but the subtitle is Populism, Immigration, and the Future of White Majorities. It's uh, by Eric Kaufman, who is a politics professor at London's Birkbeck College. I don't know if you've heard of Birkbeck. Yes, yes, I've heard of Birkbeck, Birk, Birk, yes. Okay. He's a politics professor, a political science professor there. But he was being interviewed on Canadian TV uh, in a show called The Agenda with Steve Haken. And uh, that, that program is on, your, on YouTube, so I'll mention it again. The Agenda with Steve Paikin, P-A-I-K-I-N, and you can just put in Eric Kaufman and that interview should come up. Now, what was interesting is that um, this person, Dr. Kaufman, was saying that for survival, various types of European groups who are in different geospaces, if they find that their population is, is going down for whatever reason. It could be in different places in Europe. It could be within the United States. That what they need to do is they need to find peoples who are closest to them and absorb them in as mm. being Caucasian. So they basically boost their numbers and maintain their, their cultural um, you know, I identity in general by basically grafting on other people who had not previously been considered them, but they could make them them on an honorary basis eventually. Now, this person, uh, Dr. Kaufman, was identified on the show. Um, in fact, he is from Canada, but he teaches at a college now, as we said, Birkbeck College in, in London. So he, his, his uh, ancestry was identified as Hispanic, uh, Central European Jewish, and Chinese. And so the, um, the, the host of the show, Steve Pakin, who's a white man, a Canadian, he, uh, he, told, he told this person, Dr. Kaufman, he said, you know, he said earlier periods of time, he said, you wouldn't be thought of as white or Caucasian. And Dr. Kaufman responded by saying, that may be true, he said, but I'm Caucasian today. So what that means or what that should mean for African people in the United States is basically you're down to Caucasian and Bantu. Anybody basically is a Bantu abstract, extract is basically going to be a Caucasian. So pretty much the expansion of whiteness will be and is in the United States underneath the Caucasian umbrella. And so therefore, the white ethnic stock, Euro ethnic stock is shifting from the core strain of British to European to other types of people that can be grafted in as being white or Caucasian is the case. And so the European is a pan-Caucasian predominant society. So the only way for African people who exist there to gain more leverage is for a connection to Africa, the continent, for the riches that Africa has to offer, plus their connection on a heritage level that will improve the economic situation for African people from an entrepreneurial standpoint and geopolitically as well if they reside in the United States. Even though we think that dual citizenship is an excellent idea and should happen, but just our connection with the continent will, will, will make us be better off. 
But if we are uh, a people who reject our Africanness and therefore continue intellectually, ideologically to be an appendage of the dominant Caucasian society in terms of how you identify yourself, how you think you're going to get leverage and a rejection of your heritage and the narrative of such, we doom ourselves in a pan-Caucasian environment in which we don't make any friends and linkages outside of the United States to Africa, and therefore we doom ourselves amongst other people who do not have our best interests at heart and who outnumber us so we're disadvantaged in all kinds of ways. Disadvantaged politically, disadvantaged economically, and disadvantaged in an uphill struggle for a cultural narrative if we don't reach out across borders and oceans to link with people who are of our own ancestry by, by making ourselves an appendage of those who colonize. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, agree more with that. I think um, that's just logic. That's a superior logic there. Um, and one that I just hope um, those who, who oppose um, will come around to see it sooner or later. It's a, it's a numbers game. There's a political angle to it. There's a power game. Um, there's power in numbers. Um, if whatever, uh, especially when those who are say who, who say they're fighting for um, reparations, I mean, doing that in a small faction rather than with a big, larger body, it makes sense to go with a larger body. You know, and get your voices heard. Um, so many other benefits of doing that, and it doesn't entail losing your identity. You know, as I said, when I talk about poly Africanism. If you've gained um, or, or inherited different aspects of um, of culture that you want to keep and maintain, keep and maintain. Just just as as the Pan Caucasians know, when they adopt people from other cultures, they bring their culture with them, but they still know that the body they represent is this Pan Caucasian edifice that promotes their own well-being and projects their political views onto the world. Likewise, we should be able to do the same. Right. right. Also, I should mention that um, maintaining a pan-African narrative on the so-called African-American side would also um, help to um, receive people from the continent and Caribbean who are coming into the United States because we're we're advertising ourselves as an African people. So that that should have been something also that we should have been thinking about, about how to um, you know, absorb new African people who are coming uh, into the predominance of us as an African people, where we you know, exchange you know, ideas on our Africanness, but the fact of it is that we're all African people in the same space then uh, we can create a, a greater unity. In fact, that's what most peoples do by large racial groups in the United States, um, you know, is that various cultural groups from across, you know, their ethnicities sort of band together under one label and find ways to, um, to get along for greater, you know, political and, and economic strength. So that, so it would help um, the discourse of immigrating African peoples and Caribbean peoples who are coming to the United States if the core base of Black people, African American people, identified themselves as African and was more aware of some of the angles that we've talked about, about the United States, a place of many things African, as a, as a medium to receive other people who are African so that we begin to share more about each other. You know, it's like a pan-African narrative would help. But, you know, if, if there are movements that are encouraging us to 
identify as not being African, that already puts a wedge between people who are coming to the United States, perhaps with, with uh, false knowledge about us, mm -hmm. um, with um, ideas that may not be true, uh, various apprehensions, you know, because of white supremacy domination about African people getting together, this only creates a, a vehicle for, for widening conflict when you've got a base of people in the United States who are saying they're not African, and therefore it leads to all kinds of turmoil that, oh, I'm not like you. No, you're not me. No, I'm not African anymore. No, my ancestors were African. I'm not. You know, so uh, it doesn't create uh, unity if we um, sort of don't have a, a pan-African uh, narrative. Indeed. Um, this, this, this has been a very, very interesting discussion. Um, we've, uh, we've uh, or you, you, you've rather highlighted um, a lot of the uh, embedded and trinkets and nuggets of, of African culture in the United States um, that still exist today, unadulterated. Um, and I hope it's, it's, it's exposed that to anyone's viewing and any of the viewers and um, to let them know that they can be encouraged and and, and proud that the, the culture that they, they practice is actually African culture. And it also shows that African culture has a wider um, remit and acceptance in, in, in the global um, right. sphere. Um, and more of African culture can that also be marketed from Africa and not just um, um, resources that, that's being extracted from from the earth, that the that the culture does have value, does have um, um, worth, and as long as it's packaged and and um, and, uh, and presented uh, in, a, in a in a palatable way, in a in a, in a more global minded um, um, way, then it can it can bring a much needed revenue and industry. Um, there's a lot of, of African culture that still has hasn't been um, exploited in terms of commerce um, back on the continent. And I think um, when, when we talk about uh, African-Americans, we know a lot of uh, the culture with food and music in particular has been um, utilized to a very good degree. Um, but back on the continent, there's still there's, uh, the music, I'd say yes, they, they've begun to exploit that in the past decade. Um, but when it comes to food and fashion and technology, um, a lot of it is still yet to be um, discovered or exploited. So I think many countries now are moving into that direction and are beginning to um, find a way to uh, maximize the potential and add value to their to their goods and to their to their, their cultural products. Um, speaking of which, this also brings to mind um, the imagery um, that Africa has when it comes to um, say development or commerce or, or um, trade, um, where I think to many the mind uh, still goes to an Africa that is uh, backward, not developing, um, that has, hasn't got much to offer, but uh, a kind of archaic, um, archaic representation of, uh, of underdevelopment um, and old traditions um, only being presented in that light. But I think um, that, that's, that, that, in my mind, isn't, isn't the right way to look at Africa. Africa is, like many other places in the world, both modern and ancient. and has both traditional and both um, uh, um, future uh, um, thinking, cultural practices. Um, not all of them are brought to the fore, not all of them are, are, are highlighted, not all of them are, are visible to everyone, especially from onlookers uh, or from the outside in. Um, and so I think we just all need to um, do our part and do more, and which is what we like to do here on Dark, in, in trying to exhibit uh, all sides, especially the sides that are more forward thinking, uh, the sides that are more innovative, and the size that will be able to show Africa in a different light, not just the, uh, what I sometimes like to call the colonial light, which is Africa that needs, uh, Africa the oppressed and needs help underdeveloped, uh, can't 
sort their own problems out, uh, full of problems, both um, security, education-wise, and you know, having a cultural de deficit, so, so, so to speak, um, when it comes to development. But culture could be the main driver of development. Culture could be um, the main component of development. And that's something I think we, we touched on when we had our last, our previous discussion on is um, modernity, westernization, or what is African modernity, and what, is it, what it looks like. I think that's something that um, those in positions of influence need to focus more on. Um, there's a good example of what African modernity looks like, uh, which is bringing in the cultural aspect into uh, the modern and future uh, in Kigali, R Rwanda, with the um, uh, the building, the uh, how would I call it, the, the Kigali uh, Convention, Center. Center. Convention Center. Thank in you. In fact, maybe you can show quickly on your screen if you look up the Kigali Convention Center, you'll see the architecture um, definitely reflects. Um, some aspects of the beehive uh, ancient architecture, particularly one of the um, the rounded space that sort of features uh, is a major feature of the Kigali Convention Center. In fact, in fact, we should point out that the yes, yes, that picture right there, that's um, you know, an imagery of uh, some of the ancient beehive uh, uh, architecture. But um, a lot of patterns of Rwandan art, you know, line the panels of uh, the walls inside, um, the Emigongo art. And so I think that, that convention center is definitely, you know, one of many, um, sites that bring that, you know, indigenous art and architecture made into um, a 21st century uh, building and structure into in full view as uh, something that's um, very, very African. So there should be, as you were saying, there should be no, no disconnect between Africa, technology, and culture. Those could be synonymous as it is in any other um, place in the world. Absolutely. So um, let's let's keep culture as a, as a driver of innovation and technology. Um, the young people, I think, need to um, dig in and, and 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 find out and look into extracting um, extracting information, extracting inspiration. Uh, from from the past, from their history, from their culture, in inventing um, the future. I think that that's an advantage that we would have, uh, an, an advantage that I think one thing that the colonizers um, weren't able to do. Um, they merely came for you know the bodies and the minerals and tried to subdue um, the culture in order to allow them to easily take on um, or to take away uh, um, those two things. But what they, they obviously never uh, bothered to do was to extract the, the cultural um, capital. I, I like to call it the cultural capital. So that is up to us now. I think it's up to us to, to tap into that cultural capital. And that would be the next, um, I guess, in the industrial revolution. Um, the technology that we can um, develop and the young people on the continent can develop, um, no one else will be able to, to tap into that. Um, that would be our boom. That's what we can sell to the world, be brand new um, from everything, from architecture to technology to art to buildings to um, new, new music, uh, new um, utilization of instruments that they haven't heard of yet, uh, new sounds, new... Um, sound structures, new ways of doing business, um, new ways of money payments, um, um, new new style of fashion, new ways of, of going green, new uh, sustainable um, means of development, uh, new ways of recycling. You know, there, there are lots of things that we have all these things in our ancient cultures that we haven't yet brought to the fore because we haven't looked at them as as anything worth 
uh, of worth, anything of worth putting on a, on a world stage because I think mentally um, subjugation by the European powers has rendered us thinking our things are substandard, but they're not substandard. Um, okay. just, just as good, if not better, as long as we tap into them and really um, give them the due, um, due respect that, that, that they, should, should, they should have. Um, a lot of the history is, is there. Some of it's hidden. Some of it's out there in the open. But we need to find both. We need right. To find right. Both and, and bring that to the fore. And I think that that will be our um, our revelation. Right. Right. Absolutely. Revelation. Absolutely. Okay. I've um I've got just a couple little points before we uh, wind up that I I wanted to uh, make. I wanted to say that, uh, you know, as I, as I t said some things before about basically that African people, in this case, in the United States, came from many different places on the continent, which is true. Um, and therefore, we brought varying kinds of things that survive both language and cooking influences art influences uh, from a variety of places. So basically out of many African peoples, we become kind of one, but preserving a number of things from a number of different um, locations. So having said that, given that um, Kiswahili had been pushed for some time as a recognized African language that was part of the uh, black power movement and, you know, a language that, you know, many black people have had some exposure to just in terms of words or when they thought of, you know, Africa, they thought of Kiswahili, whether or not that uh, was an exaggeration at the time, but it actually is becoming true today with the number of uh, African countries that are now seeing the utility and promoting Kiswahili as a, you know, a Pan-African language or Kimi Jakanda as we identified it on other shows uh, as, you know, the Pan-African um, tongue. Mm -hmm. And so therefore Kwanzaa as a uh, United States based African or Pan-African holiday, which on other shows we dealt with the fact that it has spread to UK, Canada, and now South Africa is celebrated by millions of people annually. It's, um, you know, linguistic base is Kiswahili. So because of that, you know, a lot of the conceptualizations of trappings of Africa in the United States kind of take on a Bantuish type um, projection just by people thinking about Kiswahili, even though, you know, people recognize all different aspects of, you know, Africa itself as a whole, but it's kind of put under, in some ways, a uh, Kiswahili umbrella. So in, in wrapping up, I wanted to mention a few additional books, and maybe I can send you the names of these and maybe you can add it to the uh, the window section of our show just as reference book but i wanted to show this book um it's called moja means one swahili counting book and it was done by um by tom and muriel feelings and this book was this book was first printed in 1972 and it was a book talking about swahili numbers and getting children to um to you know be able to count their numbers in uh swahili and even uh you know the book is an excellent uh book to show numbers in kiswahili but they define where kiswahili was spoken at the time. This is a book, 1970, 1972. So as you can see, 
that this book, um, you know, portrays even Kiswahili as being a, a language piece that African children should be, uh, you know, aware of as part of the orientation. And somehow or another, we've lost some direction in that that I think should be um, rekindled. So I wanted to mention that book uh, by Tom and Muriel Feelings. Um, and a couple of couple of more, I guess I would be uh, remiss if I didn't um, point out the Wainsey, the Pan-African Factor 21st Century View. I mean, I was one of the co-authors of it along with um, David Okombo and Kemet Shockley, but we tried to document the, as one of the things in this Pan-African oriented book to document the Africanness of uh, the diaspora and the critical need for the African diaspora in the United States and other places in the Western Hemisphere to reconnect to the continent for, for greater leverage irrespective of our, um, our current dwellings. By the way, I should point out just recently on that note, the prime minister of, uh, I'm not, I forgot whether it's prime minister or president, but let's say the prime minister slash president of uh, Barbados, Ms. Mia Motley, uh, gave an address, which I believe that Barbados is opening an embassy, I think, in, in Ghana. And she pointed out uh, in an address before Parliament that basically Ghana and Barbados are two nations of the same people. And so this, this year of return that Ghana is promoting, you know, certainly has taken effect with other places, Caribbean, who see their connection as well. And so she um, visited the Ghanaian parliament to give an address and uh, the president of Ghana um, had come to Barbados recently to give an address linking the two countries as African uh, places that are inseparable because their ancestry is of a, a common core. Um, because the United States is not a predominantly African nation, then, you know, there's not going to be any kind of, um, you know, governmental uh, connection, unless you're talking about the Congressional Black Caucus, in order to, to do that. But in terms of the formal government itself linking with an African nation in the way that uh, Barbados links, now links with Ghana, that's not the case. So that's one of the reasons why we're going to have to project our Africanness and irrespective of the environment that we live in to make those kinds of outreaches to the best of our ability as a, as an interconnection. Now, the, the, before I end with the, the final uh, book that I want to uh, mention, and I've mentioned these other books. So if anybody, you know, will, uh, see our show, you'll see some of the other books that I mentioned. But there is a couple more. One book is called Congo Across the Water, um, done as a, a multi-authored book, but one of the authors that I make mention of here in my notes, the person by the name of Susan Coxey, that was a book written in 2013. And people may think that Congo Across the Water, Congo in this case spelled K-O-N-G-O, it's talking about the four countries that made up the Congo Kingdom. But in fact, Congo across the water is talking about the assumption that you were in the Congo Kingdom in Africa and you were looking over into the United States and saw the culture of Congo in the United States. And this book is a huge book that doc documents uh, all of the lots of African culture emanating from the Congo Kingdom in, in the United States, including the origins of jazz and other <clears throat> sorts of things. And uh, the University of Florida in Gainesville had a complete, an exhibit that was based around this book 
with uh, artifacts and discussions in the Horn Museum at the university, uh, which this book was compiled with joint research between um, University of Florida uh, researchers and um, one of the universities and museums in Belgium to talk about all of the influence in Central Africa uh, that is present in the United States. So that's an excellent book. Now, finally, before I get to the very last book, I wanted to ask you what comes to mind when you hear the the name tote bag? Yeah, it's a small uh, woman's bag. Ah, handbag. Okay, tote bag. Okay. Well, the first part of that tote is from a Kiswahili word kutota, which means to carry. So all around us, there is Africa embedded in language, art, music, food, dance. As we mentioned earlier, um, technology uh, and business when it came to even the use of uh, Ubuntu um, to recognize that. Now, the final book I wanted to, to mention as we close out is an interesting book. I think it's very apropos for the program we having today, the Bantu speaking heritage of the United States. Written in 1979 by Winifred Vass, who uh, was, a, was a linguist. And what she does is she documents hundreds and hundreds thousands of words in the United States lexicon of uh, everyday usage and even place names of varying places in the United States that are extensions of various Bantu uh, languages. So I thought this book was fitting to, uh, to point out because it's just so much evidence, you know, documenting the Africanness of the United States, a place of many things African, until it's really a travesty that we don't, you know, continue that um, that research and a pan African narrative of uh, of ourselves. Um, and as we close, I wanted to mention um, a little proverb that I had uh, researched for the show particularly, a proverb that goes like this, looking carefully is understanding. It's an Ovambo uh, proverb, but I think that all that we have been talking about, looking carefully is understanding. We're trying to delve into ourselves delve into a narrative and a correct narrative about ourselves so as we make connections to our careful look, careful reflection upon ourselves, we create a greater understanding of who we are now and where we're going in the future. Excellent. I'll leave with that. Well, okay. Thank you for that, Bruzy. Thank you all for watching. Uh, please do comment, ask uh, questions, uh, forward them to uh, to myself, uh, subscribe, and um, also get a number of the um, book references um, and links um, put into the um, description. So you can all go check those out yourself. Yeah, um, and, uh, give give a minute after we end in the in in the show. But yeah, thank you, thank you so much for. Um, for having me, and uh, I enjoyed um, this discussion immensely. Likewise, and thank you all for watching. Have a good evening. Two thousand nine.